Mandatory minimums requiring judges to sentence drug offenders to a minimum sentence, even if he or she believes some leniency is merited. The debate is hot in Massachusetts, thanks in large part to a single statement made two weeks ago by the Chief Justice of the state's Supreme Judicial Court. That would be Ralph Gantz. I am convinced that minimum mandatory sentencing in drug cases will be abolished. The only question is when. Why am I so sure? Because doing so makes fiscal sense, justice sense, policy sense, and common sense. And the response to that came fast and furious, including from Suffolk County DA Dan Conley, who said it was an effort to return to a failed policy of 30 years ago. And he told the Dorchester Reporter, quote, judges are operating in a vacuum. They don't understand how drug traffickers and drug dealers and gang members are turning some neighborhoods in our city into very, very violent communities. It's a debate with very high stakes. And joining me now to hash this one out further are former federal court judge Nancy Gertner. It's good to see you, Judge, and former you. Essex County Prosecutor Bill Fallon. Good to see you, too, Bill. You. So make the case. Why are mandatory minimums a bad idea? Because they are always overbroad. They always sweep within them people that they were not meant to to cover. A conversation with one of the judges of the Suffolk Superior Court said that, for example, there are sweeps of on the Boston Common and you wind up with someone who, you know, is spending day on the Boston Common and at night in the St. Francis House who winds up with a two-year or five-year mandatory minimum. Sweeps too broad, no indication that it actually controls crime. The crime rates have been declining regardless of the sentencing policy. And the thing is, it takes all discretion from the judge and gives it to the prosecutor. And while D.A. Connolly may be fabulous, the thing about prosecutorial discretion is that it's not transparent. We don't know why they make the decisions they do. And the overwhelming number of people accused of mandatory minimum drug offenses are black. Uh, where's she wrong, Bill Fallon? I think that the discretion that we say D.A.s have, they should have. When judges, when I was a D.A. 30 years ago, the crime rate was ridiculous. The drug problems were ridiculous. Minority communities, diverse communities saying we are under attack. Guess what? They're not anymore. And I would just say, if you look, I can't even believe that the discussion is with the heroin epidemic that we have right now, that people who think people who traffic in heroin, we're talking about the opiate problem, giving it to mothers, if you will, who are pregnant and have people dying every day, that anybody would even suggest that it's good social policy, sorry, Judge Gans, that you would get rid of trafficking in heroin. I think Nobody's there's some argument. Nobody's saying get rid of it. People are saying the prosecutor exercises his discretion as to what to charge, and then the judge who hears both sides decides how to sentence. The notion that judges today would be as they were 30 years ago is absurd, partly because the press is much more attentive to how judges are sentencing. And then in addition, there's training for judges, and there are programs now. There are uh, evidence-based programs about what to do with people. But and to characterize this as a trafficker issue overstates it. I'm talking about the people who are not traffickers. You know, the, the DA... Lower level who get lumped. So yeah, you, think, right, you right. think traffickers then, it's fine for them to have mandatory sentences. You wouldn't be upset with no, that. No, no, no. I don't need a mandatory sentence. If I had someone who was trafficking large quantities of heroin, I would throw the book at them. But I don't need a mandate. I mean, the notion of a mandatory minimum, it doesn't affect what the sentence is going to be. It affects who the sentencer is. Bill, it seems to me, you have, uh, prosecutors get total discretion and they have none. Meaning, in light of the fact that what 90% of cases are ultimately there's a deal. Right. You can hold. You have well, the nobody ability, has the discretion. You have, have the deal. ability to hold a mandatory minimum sentence over a defendant's head to get him or her to plead to whatever you want with the judge totally out of the picture. Well, and How's I, that if equity? If I were a judge, I'd be upset too. Anytime somebody loses power or gains power. But it's not a question uh, of when power. I, I disagree that I do think it's a question it's, of power because question. I can tell you, although Let I'm generally against mandatory sentences, I can tell you, and we, we had this little discussion before, DAs can't appeal anything. Judges can do what they want. You know, Jim, as, as a prosecutor for 25 years, I could go to one session and some judge would say, this case is worth 18 to 20. I had another judge, sexual assault case, not drugs, said, yeah, this is worth 18 to 20 months. That's so there's truth in that, is there not? There certainly were instances, it was not across the board, where there were cases in which judges were different, but I agree 
the, the question is how to restrict, how to cabin judicial discretion. And the way to do how it to is do not that, yeah. to eliminate it. One is to think about ways of appealing in the federal courts. There was an appeal of your sentence. The other is to come up, for example, with meaningful presumptive guidelines, not mandatory guidelines, where you say that there's a ballpark. Other countries have, for example, ballpark sentences. A judge has to then justify up or down from that ballpark sentence. 30 years ago, we had nothing. We had no evidence and we had no standards. Uh, Judge Gardner, can I make a third suggestion? Is that judges should actually speak and explain controversial decisions. I, I have seen, whether it's in the federal courts and the state courts, despite what the rules clearly say, the vast majority of your colleagues and former colleagues hide behind, in my opinion, made up rules about their inability to explain something. My sense is if they stood up and said that controversial decision right. was made by me because of X, then maybe he wouldn't be in the position right. he's in right now. Isn't there merit I, there? Jim, I wrote 40, 50, 60 sentencing opinions precisely because I knew that I would be criticized if I went it all off the beaten track. And I wanted to justify what I did, and I believe I was never criticized for the sentences I gave precisely because I said, this drug dealer who's getting, the government wants a mandatory minimum, who is dealing out of his car, should not be dealt with the same way as the guy who's buying a car with the drug proceeds. That there were meaningful distinctions that the public would understand and had to be on the record. I completely agree. But you agree with me that many of your colleagues hide from public scrutiny. Stunningly, I agree with you. Okay. But, but also, I think that if you look at the facts, it's very interesting. I was saying, you know, we all talk about all these people being sent to prison. Massachusetts is 48th in incarceration. But so our incarceration rate has gone up in so the past. So it actually has it. It's gone from Bill four. Fallon. 130% over capacity, 50,000 bucks a head we pay well, to incarcerate somebody. Aren't funny mandatory you minimum say, sentences funny you part should of say that? that? The governor, the last governor, just closed two wings of, of um, Norfolk. Uh, and we now have 1,000 available beds, according this week to the Secretary of Public Safety, who said he is link thinking about closing a prison. So the, all of these figures that are out there, that's as current as you can get. Yep. I'm just suggesting, because I hear this, all of these people who are, who are going to jail who are shouldn't be in jail users are not being getting mandatory sentences and in fact what one thing I like about Dan Conley I'm not from Essex I'm Suffolk not from County, Suffolk yeah. County but the fact that he said if anybody can show that anybody is even in prison for either possession or with the drug habit that did not involve serious amounts of, of drugs or trafficking Go to him and he'll Bill get Bill Fallon, is Gantz right, though, even if you uh, b believe, as I'm sure you do, what you're saying, is Gantz right that ultimately the legislature is going to repeal this? No, he's wrong. What they're going to do, ultimately, I don't know what's going to happen. What they're going to do 20, is what? I think what they'll try to do is the Fallon plan. You'll take the lower uh, mandatory sentences, which, by the way, two years ago, the DAs led the fight to have substances go higher from uh, either 12 or 15. Should they have any discretion, judges, in these cases or not? I think they blew it before. We'll see what they can do now. And that's really the question. And I think they can on lower cases. That's my theory. On the really low level, mandatory, you get the DAs have a right to appeal. There's a presumptive sentence. And then, then somebody can at least go and look at it. We don't have that in Massachusetts. I think everybody would have more credibility. i got to hold you there because there's another issue that came up over the weekend that I want to discuss. They're about emails sent by a former prosecutor in the Plymouth County DA's office. Office, and in an apparent effort to discredit former assistant DA Karen O'Sullivan, who was called by the defense in a murder trial bought by our old boss, several emails of O'Sullivan have been released, which prosecutors say were sent from her government account before she left. Among them, a forwarded email with a photo of a young child in a Ku Klux Klan costume, and an email exchange with a fellow prosecutor about a case in which a man was accused of sexually assaulting his teenage niece, and O'Sullivan responded, quote, sounds like she wanted it. As a former assistant DA, in an era when virtually everybody I know is worried about uh, uh, our prosecutors entering matters with bias, whether it's racial bias or other things, how do we, why should we believe these are outliers? This O'Sullivan stuff is an outlier. She said she was trying to be funny, not terribly funny by my standards. Well, I, I don't think anybody wants this in society, or certainly as prosecutors. I would certainly be looking at her cases, and I'm sure the DA will, to see, let's see what she prosecuted. Let's see, lots of cases. I don't know how, she wasn't the first assistant, or I don't know anything about her. Her new, she's the first assistant in Bristol County now, and her new boss says no. that he has total confidence in I her, understand. even though she admits she wrote these things. By the way, here's another one. Uh, uh, for my liberal friends, there's a black woman with one white boob and one black boob. It's former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice with Biden on one side and President Obama on another. This woman should be working in a prosecutor's office? Well, 
I maybe wouldn't want her there, but one thing I'll say is when Cruz found out about these, at least from what we know, because there was they wanted all of these records. Cruz, Plymouth County DA. Yeah, yeah, Cruz is the DA. He sent them over. They're a little ticked off that they sent them. I'm glad he sent them. There's like a full disclosure. Now I think Cruz, and I do think it's incumbent upon him to look at what kinds of cases she handled, whether in fact there was, if we will, bias or just inappropriateness about this. Where she wasn't first assistant, somebody did review her cases, I presume, in Cruz's office, and that's what I'd be looking at. That is at. what has to happen here, is it Well, not? that's right, and it, but it dramatizes the point about who should have discretion. Discretion given to the prosecutor is discretion that is not transparent. They never say, here's why I'm charging this person the mandatory minimum. Uh, it's just not, as I suggest as judges should explain right. that. Yeah. It's not transparent. It's not on the record. We don't know what the patterns are. It, this, this, this incident suggests that maybe one should look at her sentencing patterns, but I want to look at the charging patterns of DA Connolly's office. I want to look at the charging patterns of all the offices. I want to understand why minorities wind up targeted with mandatory minimums more than white folks do. Well, fortunately, the new statistics are showing that, in fact, there are fewer blacks as a minority uh, being incarcerated. That, in fact, when people talk about fewer this, than what? Fewer than there were 10 uh -huh. years ago. And also, I, I have to say, as a person who, as a DA, and I know they do it in Suffolk County, again, I'm not from Suffolk County, when you go to the communities, I can tell you, the diverse communities, the minority communities, and it is basically a class issue in many ways, and you have 40 people out there, it is shocking to many of us who do have a different color or a different background when everybody says, I want the school zone violation, I want mandatory sentence, I want my kids to have a chance that they don't have because of the crappy schools, because there's no yeah, education. But, but, that's, but that's an interesting question. Question. The more money we put into prisons, the less money we have for drug addiction pre treatment, for school pro, you know, programs. Unfortunately, we're 48 out of 50. We no, but, uh, but essentially, what's, what's wonderful about the setting in which uh, Gant Connolly spoke was that people were talking about innovative solutions to deter crime, to prevent crime, to deal with people who get out of jails. The mandatory minimums take the steam out of that because they basically divert resources. Oh, we only have 30 seconds left. How do we assure the public that there are not more O'Sullivan's there? And again, I don't know her from a hole in the wall, I just know her writings. How do we assure them that there aren't more of her in prosecutors' offices. Well, but see, that's very interesting. When I became a judge, there was an out, you know, there was an open process to select me. People talked about it. Who does he hire? And what are their hiring decisions based on? We have to go, Judge Gertner. Good to see you. Reminds me of the vice president. If you were going to do the vice president again and all of those foibles and inappropriate conduct, he's vice president. We voted for him. What do we do? Bill Fallon, good to see you. <laughs> we'll discuss that next time.